Okay, welcome back after our break. This is our last session of the day. I hope your brains are still fresh enough to stick with me for a little bit. Um, I've written a lot of notes in this text so that I hope that whatever I, you can't remember from what I say because your brain's too full, you'll be able to read through later and um, kind of mull over and um, put these things into practice. All of these skills that we taught you today are things that become second nature as you use them. It's like any skill that you learn. Uh, my husband's at a golf, uh, getting golf lessons right now to correct his golf swing, and he's having to think about each step, each step of his back swing, each step of his kind of forward swing right now um, because he's changing something and he's correcting something and he's having to think through everything. But the plan is that as he does this more and more, he'll get muscle memory, he'll know how to do it, and he won't have to think through each step along the way. And so our goal for you is that as you kind of start practicing these tools and start using these tools, they'll become more and more part of your muscle memory, more and more part of what you do every time you, you go to the scriptures. Uh, we have one woman in our Bible studies this year who said, like, I'm finally understanding now how I could pick up kind of any book of the Bible and the steps that I could take to study that passage. And, and that's our goal with you today, and that's our goal with all our women and all our studies. And so we hope that this is, day is an encouragement to you. Today, we're going to end the day by talking about how we connect to the gospel. So as you know, Kendra kind of walked us through that whole pathway of going from the original or the text to the original audience, and then the original audience to the gospel, and then the gospel to today. Um, Bronwyn walked us through that first step of going from the, um, one of the big ways to get from the kind of the text to the original audience to see what issues the original audience was, was working on. And so now I'm going to do a little bit more in detail work as to how then we get to the gospel. Once we kind of know what our text is about, how do we connect it to the gospel of Jesus? And so page 16 has a diagram that's the Simeon Trust Diagram. And that's just to kind of help you get a visual of the diagram. The cross is in the middle, and the arrow pointing upwards uh, means the connection to Jesus Christ's ascension, his death and his ascension. Um, if you go to page 17, that's where we're going to kind of follow through my, my notes on this topic. And so we want to think, as we talk about connecting to the gospel, we want to think what the point is of the biblical story. How do we know kind of what the main idea is of all these 66 books of the Bible? When my kids were little and they would watch a movie and I would ask them, well, what's the point of that movie? What's the big story of that movie? Or when they'd read a book and I'd say, what's the point of that book? They didn't know how to summarize. They didn't know how to get to the point. They would just ramble all over about all the details and all the characters and all the different things they said and the funny different episodes. And I would sit there thinking, man, I just want to get to the point. And sometimes that's how people might feel in our Bible studies as we're kind of rambling all over and going all over the place. Um, but we're not getting to the point of the Bible. And the point of the Bible is Jesus Christ. The point of the Bible is that all of it points towards him. From the Old Testament, from the very beginning of the scriptures to the very end of the scriptures, all of it points somehow to the main character of the scriptures, Jesus Christ. And we get that information, or we get that kind of um, conviction from the words of Jesus himself. So Luke 24, verse 13 to 27, uh, this is Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with a bunch of um, people who kind of hadn't recognized him yet. Jesus had died, he's been resurrected from the dead, and it says that that very day, two of his disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the man who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened, and moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him, but him they did not see. And he said to them, and Jesus said to these disciples, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And the key verse is this, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So walking along this road, Jesus interprets to them, to these disciples, all the things concerning himself, Jesus, that he says were written about by Moses, that were written about by the prophets. 
Later, uh, Jesus has a Bible study time with his own disciples, the 12 apostles, and verse 44 to 46 says this, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So again, Jesus is telling his apostles, his 12 disciples, that everything that was written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and the Psalms, basically the whole Old Testament, he's saying all of these books were somehow written about me. They were talking about the fact that the Christ would come, that the Christ would suffer, that the Christ would die, and on the third day would rise from the dead. And in response to the story, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. So Christ is making this claim in Luke 24 that he is the point of the scriptural story. And so if we want to preach, if we want to teach, if we want to lead small group discussions showing that Jesus is the point of the scriptures, we need to know how to get to the point. How do we actually show people the point of the Bible from any passage that we are reading through, whether that's Exodus and whether that's Colossians? So Brian Chappelle, who wrote a book called Christ-Centered Preaching, has this quote. He says, Christ-Centered Preaching or we could say Christ-centered teaching, Christ-centered small group Bible studies, rightly understood, does not seek to discover where Christ is mentioned in every text, but to disclose where the text stands in relation to Christ. Sometimes people get this idea that in the Old Testament, Christ is kind of behind every bush. He's in every, every prophetic message. He's everywhere in the scriptures. He's not actually there, but this text stands in a specific spot in relation to Jesus. It points to Jesus somehow. And so he's saying what we need to find is not where Christ is. He's not popping up in every spot in the Old Testament, but he may, this text stands in relation to Christ. The grace of God culminating in the person and work of Jesus unfolds in many dimensions throughout the pages of scripture. The goal of the preacher or teacher or small group leader is not to find novel ways, not to find unique ways of identifying Christ in every text, but to show how each text manifests God's grace in order to prepare and enable his people to embrace the hope provided by Christ. So our goal as Bible study leaders, as teachers, as people who are walking alongside people in the scriptures is to show people how every text in the Bible somehow points towards Christ. And we're going to give you some tools to know how to do that. So first of all, we want to show you what not to do, and then we're going to show you what to do. So what not to do, uh, I have a little diagram there saying, what happens if we try to get to the point of the Bible story, biblical story, if we try to get to the point of Jesus without following this pathway that Kendra has identified for us? Well, there's a couple different kind of, there's the main pathway in the bold white, and then there's some um, different options in the, with dotted lines, which are the ones that we don't want to do. So we're going to briefly describe each of those. Kendra talked about the fact that we don't want to go directly, jump directly from the text to today, because what happens then, we often import a lot of meaning into the text that isn't actually there. And some people call that kind of allegorizing the text, like we make things um, correspond to each other that aren't actually corresponding. So an example would be, uh, when we were going through Exodus as a Bible study group, um, we have the story in Exodus 14, verse 16, Uh, so this is going on to page 18 of your book. How could we allegorize that story? Well, we could say, well, God led his people through the Red Sea. This proves that he will lead me through all my problems and I don't have to worry about them by myself. The Red Sea in this story becomes an allegory of our problems and us walking through the Red Sea is us walking through our problems. But the problem is, if we actually look at the story, if we follow the rest of the study of Exodus, we realize that God's people had lots of problems after the Red Sea. This this journey through the Red Sea didn't stop them, didn't get rid of all their problems. They still had to walk through the wilderness. They had to deal with the fact that they didn't have water. They had to deal with their disobedience and their sin. So the journey through the Red Sea delivered them from something, but it wasn't a delivery from their problems. And so if we don't look at the story, we correspond to things that aren't meant to be together. The Red Sea does not equal our problems. So then we want to look at how do the New Testament authors talk about this deliverance? Well, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13, talks about the, the, makes a correspondence between the Israelites leaving the slavery of Egypt and Christians leaving the slavery of sin. And so this walk through the Red Sea is a walk through God's deliverance from slavery. In the Old Testament, it's a delivery from slavery, to physical slavery. In the New Testament, it's a deliverance from this slavery to sin. And so that's the correspondence that the biblical authors make. So we don't want to just r- jump straight from the text 
to today without looking at seeing how do the biblical authors understand this event. Uh, the second thing that can go wrong is if we go straight up that path to the original audience, but then we don't think about the gospel at all, uh, and it goes straight down today, we can tend to moralize the text. So Romans 12, 9 to 11, I was going to read it, but I won't uh, for the sake of time, is a whole bunch of examples or a whole bunch of instructions on how we should love people. So we, if we moralize a text, we can talk about the fact that this is what Christian love looks like. We should love like this. But the problem is that we can't perfectly love like this, and so then we feel like failures. We resist being told what to do, and so we know we can't, we, we can't live up. We can't do what God is asking us to do in this text. But if we look at how that text is understood within the book of Romans, we see that Paul is telling us that you can love like this because of what Jesus has done for you. And the first nine chapters of, G of Romans is God telling us about the grace upon grace upon grace that's been lavished upon us in Jesus. And uh, Romans 12, 1 to 2, right before this, it says, Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And so he tells us what to do after making sure that we are fully convinced and confirmed in knowing what Jesus has done for us. So if we go straight from that original audience, those instructions, to today without thinking about how Jesus' gospel, how his life, how his death, how his resurrection empowers us to do it, we tend to moralize people, or sorry, moralize a passage, and we give people all kinds of instructions on what they should do, and they feel like they can never live up, they can never um, just meet those standards. We bury them with moral examples. The third option is if we go straight from the text, instead of going up the path to the original audience, we just jump right to the gospel. We don't care about what it meant to the original audience. We can tend to spiritualize the text. We can make a, a link between two things that aren't necessarily linked in the original scriptures. So in Joshua 2, we have a story of Rahab, who is a prostitute who uh, hid some spies in her house, and then she let them go um, in the morning. She protected them from the king, and she hung a red cord out her window in order for them to be able to identify her house. And so if we just look at, wow, this red cord reminds me of the red blood of Jesus, um, maybe that's a connection, maybe that's a symbolization, maybe we should understand that this red cord was Rahab's way of understanding salvation, and we spiritualize this idea, and this red cord becomes like a really big idea for us. But the problem is that that connection isn't made anywhere in the Bible. There's nowhere in the Bible that people talk about using your red cord, holding up your red cord. We're importing a meaning that the biblical authors don't give to this red cord. So if we look at what's important to the biblical authors about Rahab, what do people write over and over and over again about Rahab when they write about her in the Bible? Rahab is remembered for her faith. She's remembered for her courage. She's remembered for the fact that she was willing to give up all of her own gods to follow the true God, to follow Yahweh, to throw herself at the mercy of God's people, come what may. That's what we need to preach from Rahab, from Joshua too, about Rahab's story. Not about a red cord. We need to preach about this posture that she had, that she was willing to give up her whole past, give up all her allegiances, give up her family, because she was throwing in her lot wholeheartedly with the Lord. And so if we miss that, what is happening in the original audience, uh, and we go, go right to the gospel, we spiritualize something, and we give it a meaning that it was not intended to have. So that's ways we can do it wrong if we don't follow the pathway, if we don't go the long, safe way around, uh, like Kendra talked about. So what can we do instead? What can we do is follow the pathway, and that will really help us. It'll help us stay safe. And I just lost my page. Where was it? There we go, page 19 in your books. So how can we get to the point of Jesus by following the pathway? Well, first of all, like Kendra said, like Bronwyn said, we want to do that first leg of the pathway. We want to do a lot of work. We want to spend a lot of time, maybe an hour or two, understanding that original story, what it meant to the original audience that it was written to, why it was written, what the intention of the author, as far as we can understand, was. Was it to correct them? Was it to encourage them? What was the message to the original audience? And once we've done that, once we've kind of got to our main point of what we think that story is all about, because we've looked at the structure of the story, we've looked at the context of the story, then we want to take, start taking that step across that, that top pathway 
and ask ourselves, where does our story, where does this story, this specific story then, fit into the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? If everything, like Jesus said in Luke 24, if everything is somehow connected to him in that it points forward to him or points back to him, we want to say, how does this story, now that I understand it, how does it How is it related to the gospel of Jesus? How is it related to his life, his death, and his resurrection, and the forgiveness of sin and call to repentance that's required in response? So Brian Chappell, the one who wrote that Christ-centered expository uh, preaching that I quoted earlier, uh, he has given us four categories that I think are super helpful uh, to think through as we figure out how does the connect, text connect to the gospel. He says text will be one of these four. All biblical texts will fit into one of these four categories. Either, so some will be preparatory texts. And what he means by preparatory texts, uh, this is a lot of the Old Testament texts, a lot of the Old Testament narratives, basically Genesis to uh, 2 Kings. It prepares people for the coming of Jesus by showing them the nature of sin and people's need for a savior. So Jesus is not explicitly mentioned anywhere in these texts, but we can draw a connection to Jesus by understanding how this text that prepares them for the coming of Jesus by showing them the nature of their sin, by showing them their need for a savior. So Old Testament texts are often preparatory. Old Testament texts can also be predictive. So there are some specific texts that directly predict something about the coming Messiah, the coming savior that would, that would come to fulfill uh, the expectations of the people, the promises to Abraham. And so we have Psalm 2, which talks about this coming king. We have Isaiah 53, which talks about the suffering servant. Uh, We have things like the Old Testament sacrificial system that that shows us kind of our need for atonement, our need to be in right relationship with him. Uh, We have the tabernacle construction, which shows us something about the work that Jesus is going to do as our high priest. And so there's certain texts that will actually predict this work that we need to save us. And so Old Testament texts generally fit into that preparatory or predictive um, format. Another way to look at texts is, once you've got to that main idea, like I said, is to look at, is this a reflective text? And reflective texts is a text that reflects on the ministry of Jesus by illuminating who he is and what he calls us to do. So this would be most of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Jesus is right there in the text. It's reflecting on him, what he's calling people to do, what he wants of them, and that'll help us connect it to the Gospel. There's also parts of the New Testament letters which describe Uh, Jesus' ministry specifically. So Philippians 2, 5 to 11, where it talks about Jesus uh, emptying himself, taking on the form of a servant, becoming humble and obedient to death, even death on a cross, that reflects on the ministry of Jesus. And so that would be a reflective text. And the fourth is a resultant text. So a text that teaches us how we should live as a result of receiving God's grace. God has done all these things for us, and so how should we live as a result of receiving his grace? through salvation. This can be an Old Testament text, so we get the Ten Commandments right after we get, in Exodus 19, we get a story of how God delivered them, God's explanation of how he delivered them, and in response to that, they're supposed to live in a certain way in Exodus 20. Or it can be lots of the New Testament that say, therefore, in view of God's mercy, make yourself a living sacrifice. Um, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be conformed by the transform, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we have this idea that as a result of what Jesus did, now live in this way. And so once you've done that understand your story work, it's really helpful to think through, okay, now I get the story. Is this story predictive? Is this story preparatory? Is this story reflective? Or is this story resultant of the work of Christ? And once you've kind of nailed that down in your mind, which of those four categories this scripture story picks into, you can ask the text certain questions, and that that will help you see the gospel connections. And so for a preparatory text, like I said, this is again is most of the Old Testament texts, most of the Old Testament stories, they don't necessarily mention Jesus, but you can say, what do we learn about how Christ is foreshadowed or anticipated? What do we learn about who God is? What do we learn about the relationship between God and man? What do we learn about the problem of sin? What does it look like to follow God in this text? How does God save in this text? And I can promise you, if you work through a preparatory text with these questions in mind, you'll begin to see some of those links to the gospel. A predictive text, so a text that you can see is actually pointing to the fact that this is a prediction of the coming Messiah, a prediction of Jesus. You can just say, how is the gospel and our need for Christ foreshadowed here directly? As you read the suffering servant psalm uh, in Isaiah 53, like how does this tell us who the Christ is going to be? 
a reflective text. So this is again a text that is in the Gospels uh, or reflects specifically on the work of Jesus. We can ask, what do we learn about who Jesus is? What does Jesus say he has come to do? How does Jesus help people see their need of him? What appears to be keeping or have kept people from responding to Jesus? That's where it shows us kind of our heart attitudes or our sin attitudes, the, the need for our Savior because we're, because we're resisting something Jesus has called us to do. What response is Jesus calling from those he meets? These questions, again, are going to help us diagnose again how we connect our text to the gospel. And the fourth is a resultant text. So again, these texts are texts that reflect back on God's deliverance and say, now how can we live as, a, live as his people in light of what he has done for us? So asking questions, what do we learn about who God is in this text? What do we learn about the relationship between God and man? What do we learn about the problem of sin and how Jesus has come to deal with it? What does it look like to be a disciple? And how are we empowered? This is a big one. How are we empowered to be a disciple? Because God never gives us all kinds of rules without giving us the power to do them. And so we want to look for the clue in the text. What's the gospel power that's actually going to allow me to do this, what God's called me to do? What does this text teach me about who I am in Christ? Because so much of the New Testament is about reshaping our mind about who we are and our identity or what Jesus has done for me in order to empower or convince me to obey. If we believe that we are sons and daughters of the king, if we know that we are sons and daughters of the king and that we're holy and we're beloved and we're chosen, we're going to live in light of that. So how is this text convincing me or changing my ideas so that I'm empowered to obey? How is our need for Jesus seen here? That gives us an overview, that gives us an idea of how we can use this tool in order to kind of connect our text to the gospel. And so what I want to do is give you now some time in your small groups to work through two particular texts. So I'm going to get Jan and Bronwyn's group to work through the Colossians um, 3, 12 to 17 text. And um, Kendra and my group are going to work through the um, Numbers 12 text. And if you have time, we're going to be back here by about 2.10. If you have time, go jump to the next one. But what I want you to do is read through that text and think through some of these exercises. This is a workshop, so we want to get you thinking through it. Thinking through how could it be taught incompletely if we went straight from text to today? What would be some of the kind of weird ways it could be preached? And then think through, okay, what kind of text is it? Is it reflective, resultant, preparatory, predictive? And then based on that, think through some of those questions. How could we teach this text in light of the gospel? How could we make those gospel connections? So I'll give you till 2.10 to see what you can come up with on these passages. Okay, I'm going to quickly wrap up our discussion that we would have had in our groups so that you kind of know if you did one passage what the other passage was about. And I hope that you found this really helpful um, just to think through the questions and help you kind of make those gospel connections. My group was saying, this is so helpful. And I said, I know, because I did this last night. I just chose this text kind of randomly because I thought, well, Numbers 12 is a nice short story. And I didn't know even what the gospel connections were. But working through the questions systematically or sorry, where the gospel connections were, but working through the questions systematically really helped me to see how this pointed to uh, the gospel of Jesus. And so Numbers 12, how could it be taught incompletely if you don't connect it to the gospel? Well, we could talk about it, don't be a racist. Like the fact that Miriam and Aaron were uh, talking about Moses' Cushite wife and got punished for it, we could say, see, that shows us we shouldn't be a racist. Uh, I could talk about the fact that we should respect our God-appointed leaders. Um, that other people may have to suffer for our sins, that we should pray for people who have sinned. So for those of you who didn't do, I should have explained, for those of you who didn't do the Numbers 12 story, it's the story of uh, in the wilderness, Moses is leading his people, but his brother and sister rebel against him. They say, why should we follow this Moses? He's married a foreigner, and so God punishes them and gives leprosy to Miriam. And we have the story, and we think, what are the gospel connections? And so people can write sermons on racism, on the humility of Moses, on people suffering for your sins. And I actually Googled sermons on Numbers 12, and that, those topics came up. People talked about this being a story about racial reconciliation. But if we look at the fact that what type of text it is, we see that it's actually a preparatory text. It's a text that's preparing us for this coming Savior that's going to come. And as we walk through the different questions, uh, what do we learn about how Christ is foreshadowed or anticipated? We see hints in this text that is pointing to the fact that Moses is kind of being shown as a type of Christ, that Moses is described here as being faithful in God's house. 
And if we do cross-references, we see that's kind of language that's picked up in Hebrews as Moses is faithful in God's house as a servant, but Jesus is faithful as a son. And we see a couple different places where Moses is being shown as a type of Christ, a foreshadowing of Christ. And the fact that the people are, that Miriam and Aaron are punished is because they're, they're going against God's chosen mediator, against God's chosen person that's spent to lead them. And so the gospel connection as we work through all these questions is the fact that as people, we kind of want to go around Jesus to get to God sometime. We want to have our own glory. We want to have our own relationship with God. We don't like this mediator. And what the scripture is showing us is that we have to give, we have to give respect, we have to give honor to the only one that can intercede on our behalf. In the Old Testament text, it was Moses. In the New Testament text, it's Jesus. And working through these questions helps us see the gospel connection of that story of Numbers 12 uh, to the work, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the big gospel idea of the text. Uh, the Corinthi- or Colossians 3, 12 to 17 uh, was a little bit easier text in the sense that um, it's very straightforward. It's a New Testament letter. It gives lots of instructions. But how we could incorrectly teach it is basically just making it a moralistic sermon. It talks about putting off our old self, putting off our new self, putting on our new self. And so we can make it into a whole bunch of rules, a whole bunch of to-do lists, New Year's resolutions, things that we should do. But if we look at the fact that it's a resultant text, that it's telling us what we should do in light of what he said in Colossians 1 and Colossians 2 about the amazing fact that our sins have been nailed to the cross, the amazing fact that Jesus holds the world all together, that he has redeemed us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son, all these pieces then we see that we can act this way as a result of what God has done for us. And our, we may preach the same or kind of encourage people to live the same way, but we're going to spend a whole lot of time in Colossians 3, 12 to 17 on showing how it talks about who we are in Jesus, that we're holy, that we're beloved, that we're chosen, that we're forgiven, that God's peace can rest on us and his word can dwell richly in us and this transforms us. And so as we teach this text, if we're focusing on the resultant questions, we're gonna bring out all those things that teach us about our identity in Christ, that teach us about how we are empowered by Christ, so that as we give these instructions on what we should do, we're also telling people how to do it how to do it in the power of Christ, how to do it in the identity of Christ. And so I hope that working through these questions has helped you see how you can make legitimate connections between that message to the original audience and how it connects to the gospel of Jesus. So the final little few things I wanted to say on the, on the last pages of our um, workbook before we go into like our last Q&A with the four of us. Where do women in our groups most often go wrong in connecting a text to the gospel? So I was gonna do this as a large group Q&A, but we'll just kind of, I'll give you my answers for it so we have more time for for Q&A. Allegory, moralism, or spiritualism. So my guess, you can tell me in your groups, or you can think about your own groups, but my guess is moralism um, and spiritualism. So moralism, because we as women, we want to know what to do. We wanna have a to-do list. We want to know when we've accomplished something. We want to know when we're kind of on the good side, not on the bad side. We want to know if we're doing well. And so we will tend to give people kind of lists of what they can do and how they can be good Christians. And sometimes we miss that gospel power in the midst of it. We miss connecting to that gospel, the result, working as a result of Christ's work. We can also tend towards spiritualism because somehow we get all excited about things like Rahab's red cord and other symbols that we think are important, that we think are meaningful, and we don't actually look at the text to see is that actually picked up by any biblical author. Uh, we like to have these aha moments instead of actually doing the hard work of just working through the text and saying, what does God really want me to hear, hear, hear he, hear, hear. Oh, that's a weird way to say it, but in the spot. We get excited about mystical connections. How can you model connecting a text to the gospel? So if you think of being in a small group with people, how can you model this? So if someone in your group is moralizing, if someone in your group is telling you, these are all the things that we need to do, how can you correct them? We can say, we can ask the question, how does the knowledge of God's grace, how does the knowledge of God's forgiveness, of Jesus' sacrifice move you to action? move you to do these things? How does that knowledge cause you to want to act in this way? You can ask, how did the Holy Spirit empower you to obey these things? How can we rely on God's grace to do this? If someone in your group is spiritualizing, what can you do? If they're drawing all kinds of connections and symbolisms that aren't actually there in the text, 
You could ask, so where do you see that idea being picked up by other biblical authors? Is there any other place in scripture that they draw that same connection? In a gentle way, not telling somebody that their idea is wrong, you can ask them to kind of just show evidence or show proof, or maybe go home and look up if there's anywhere else in scripture that you can see that idea being brought out. You can search through cross-references in your Bible together and say, do other biblical authors bring out that idea as you go from the cross-references that the biblical scholars um, put together? And if someone in your group is jumping right from the text today, which is what Kendra was talking about, what can we do then? Well, we can just encourage them to over and over again to just walk through that pathway to say, okay, let's wait on that idea until we've done this step to the original audience, and then after that, after we've connected to the gospel, then let's look at what it says for us today. So just that patient, careful, kind work, like Kendra said, of continuing to train people to walk along that pathway. So that would be my advice, my encouragement to you. Uh, We're going to go into a large group uh, Q&A just as we end the day. We have about 10 minutes left. And so we will look again for hands raised. Um, All four of us will be pinned to the screen. And feel free to ask any questions that you may have for us as we leave. Oh, before we do that quickly, um, I just have on this page other ways to make gospel connections, and there's two options there, but then also helpful resources for making gospel connections. And so there's two Bibles uh, that are great. Uh, The ESV Gospel Transformation Bible helps helps people to see each passage in light of the gospel. And also there's a big fat book called A Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament that helps us see how New Testament authors use Old Testament passages. So Q&A, and then we'll send you off for the day. And just explaining that third step, especially those four ways you can, you know, assess a passage. And um, Mm -hmm. I think sometimes one of the problems is we don't have the whole story of the Bible in our minds too that can um, Mm. be really difficult. And uh, we kind of go, well, where does this book of Numbers fit into the whole story? Um, I like that you called that third step. Was it his story? Yeah. I love that. So it kind of text their story, his story, and then our story. Our story, yeah. Cool. And yeah. sometimes we don't know the his story, and it's really good to get uh, somehow get hold of the whole story, the whole Bible, mm-hmm. um, what we call a Bible overview. And there are books that help us do that. I don't just mean the events that happened. I mean, what's the one key overarching message of the yeah. book? the salvation story from Genesis to Revelation and what God is doing to redeem and where does this passage play a part of that as well yeah that's a great like that's an extra great tool but totally if you can the more you can understand that like how the Bible fits together as one story the more you're going to be able to fit these individual stories into it Mm -hmm. yeah yep yeah so yeah Jan and Bronwyn I think the first time I met Jan she came to our church and gave me a copy of the Bible overview study and we worked through it with a bunch of women, um, 27 week Bible overview, which is awesome at doing that kind of very thing. So there's a lot of different options um, that we can do to yeah, learn that, that biblical story. Yeah. I mean, that's more of a course. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Than a, yeah mm-hmm. Which is, we've done, a, I'm just in the midst of doing it with somebody again right now for about the fourth time. And I learn something new every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Joanne Wilkie has a raised hand. Okay, go ahead. Just realized. (laughs) Okay, Um, this is mostly for Jan and Bronwyn because we've just uh, gone through Ecclesiastes and we're heading into Job. And, you know, I'm in a group of uh, young moms that are, they're just super intelligent and they're really, uh, they're rich. The Bible study is rich and they, they're strong Christians and, um, it's a wonderful study, um, but I would say they tend to jump to the message of the cross really quick. So, um, you know, when we were studying Ecclesiastes and Job in the beginning, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to see see it pointing to Christ immediately. Like, did you, how did you slow your groups down in that sense and, and kind of um, wade through the muck and that, you know, like together, like we did, but um, I would say, our, yeah, we often jumped there quickly. Does that make sense? Am yeah, I making totally. sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go, Jenny? No, you go, Bronnie. <laughs> yeah. I know sometimes pastorally we're anxious about moving people onto the good news quickly. I remember reading Romans chapter one, two, <laughs> three, and people going, oh, 
but Jesus saves us from all of this, doesn't he? And you go, yeah, he does. And um, so you're pastorally sensitive, but feeling the weight of sin mm -hmm. makes mm -hmm. us long for the Savior. Mm -hmm. And Ecclesiastes sure made me long for someone to rescue me out of hell. We're talking about the word in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, which is vanity, vanity. Everything's, everything's just, and it's talking about living out of the garden and living. Um, mm. And I think making people feel the consequences of sin that the book is, is all about. So it's, it was, pre, it was um, what was the fourth piece? It was showing us our need for a savior who would come outside from under the world, mm. outside the world to save us. Mm. So you do need to make them feel the weight of, I mean, God has done that for a reason. Why does God give eight, eight nine chapters on the decorating the temple? Mm. And then you think, and then he does it again in Exodus. <laughs> you, have it, you know, it's for a reason. We are not smarter than God. And it's just because we don't know the reason. We've just got to kind of go, okay, it's for a reason, you know. And so there's something about, um, I think for us in Joe, we're going to have to go, let's not run to the answers too quickly. Let's wait. And we will appreciate um, the Redeemer Christ even more. And I think from Job, we will understand what a suffering servant looks like truly. Um, when Luke 24, mm -hmm. Jesus said the Christ must suffer, where do we find the Christ must suffer in the Old Testament? Well, we see it in Isaiah 54, but we see it very profoundly in the Psalms, which are about a Messiah suffering mm -hmm. in 1 and 2 Samuel, as King David comes into his kingdom suffering. And in Job, we have an innocent sufferer and we go, it means he's isolated from friends. It means he's abandoned. It means he feels cast away from God. That's what the cross was. So we will appreciate far more deeply the cross of Christ if we're willing to do the hard work again. Yeah, that's a good word, Bronnie, because I think it's, I mean, Joanna, I mean, you think we're so anxious to jump to Christ in Ecclesiastes and Job's because it is, they're such hard books. I mean, they're so discouraging apart from Christ. And, uh, and um, so that's, that's really helpful, Bron. Um, and the thing is, I think we can kind of hold them to the questions in the study too, that keep us there, that keep us working through the passage a bit more than going straight, straight there, you see, yeah. Hmm. yeah this is easy great. though, yeah. That's great. Um, I had a question chatted to me because of a noise concern on the other end of the microphone. So what is the best tip you have when women share an answer that starts with, I got this from a commentary. <laughs> so what do, what do we think? Crystal, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I say off the top right away is a lot of times is that we want to first have the words of the text like we want to be wrestling with the text throughout our studies and so I try to say that at the end, beginning of all of our studies just to kind of have that framework in people's minds so you don't have to ask answer a question kind of defensively and then I also try to say which commentaries if they are going to go that which commentaries I would recommend because what happens sometimes is people will pick any book off any shelf and I'm like I don't know how trustworthy this person is and that freaks me out because I can't read every book I don't know all the authors and so I encourage people so I try to direct it before that even happens mm -hmm. but then I think it's just a matter of um, just trying to say well so where do we see that in the text do you see that supported in this text do you see that idea come out like is that an idea that you see rooted in the text and just trying to just keep bringing people back to the text of scriptures and seeing yeah I think it's helpful to to recognize that commentary is not scripture commentary is somebody's opinion um and some commentators are, are really, really well-trained and have really good opinions. And some are really not well-trained and don't have great opinions. And so the same way that you would want to um, evaluate if preaching is faithful, you compare it to the scriptures. And so what we need to do with a commentary in our small groups is not say, well, the commentary said, um, and so that must be the right answer. But what we wanna do is take the commentary and say, well, let's evaluate it based on the scriptures. So we're not using the commentaries or jumping off point, but we're wanting to anchor it 
back in the word. And so the more we as, as small group leaders or teachers are, are convinced of the main idea, the more we're convinced of the gospel connection and we spend that time doing the tedious work of observation and context, we will have more um, uh, skill and more confidence to say, I agree with this commentator or mm -hmm. I disagree with this commentator. Mm -hmm. And those can be really fruitful conversations. But when we skip doing the work ourselves and just go to other people who have done the work, we just don't really have um, any basis to say whether it's a wise opinion or an unwise opinion. Mm -hmm. So um, commentaries, I think, are the a later resource once you have your own opinion um, to be able to, to evaluate and often multiple commentaries are helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So I would encourage the women, if they're not really doing the, the questions and, and some of the work on their own and they're just jumping to the commentaries for answers, I would encourage them to put their commentaries on a bookshelf and just open up the Bible first. Yeah, I would too, for sure. Because I, I find um, for myself, I mean, the work that's done in me by the Holy Spirit uh, is throughout the week as I'm spending time in the passage. Uh, it's not by something I've read in a commentary. I mean, it's, an, it's a nice insight for sure. It's knowledge. But it isn't the transforming work of the word of God that happens for us when we really spend time in the scriptures struggling with things. So uh, that's from that perspective, I always encourage people to spend time in the word mm -hmm. on their own without the use of a commentary. Yeah, and this isn't, this isn't, sorry, Brian, just saying that this isn't saying commentaries are useless. No, they are invaluable sure. yeah. to the work yeah. of digging really, really deeply. So yeah. there's a high priority placed on, on valuable and, and um, gospel-centered commentaries. Yeah. Um, but it's just uh, for us as just readers of the word, uh, there is an order of priority that we want to place. And we want the priority to be placed on the scriptures, on the actual text. That's where the treasure is. Mm. Yeah, and we want to give people tools for helping them discern which are good commentaries. And yeah. like, there's a lot of different kind of rating systems and stuff that you can go to to see which ones are more faithful than others. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sometimes is just a matter of confidence. People don't feel confident mm -hmm. in their handling of the word of God. And uh, that's a, it might be an indication of that. So um, they're reading lots of other books about the Bible. Um, and uh, I, I think there has been an erosion of confidence in the word of God over the last years where you, people are reading books about the Bible or doing book studies instead of Bible study or listening to the experts online or playing videos instead of actually just letting the gals get to do the word of God themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's just because there's been an erosion of the word of God, which has been a victory of Satan. Mm -hmm. And we want everyone, every woman to be equipped to read the Bible themselves. Um, so like Crystal's girl, they go, ah, I can pick up one and two Samuel. Um, so to remove the fear factor. Um, so be gentle, be gentle with it. But um, going, if you get excited about reading the text, yeah yeah any other questions you always have our email addresses and stuff too you can email yeah. us or most of you are connected to churches that we're affiliated with so yeah well if you're if you're leading i just would say that we have lots of resources online at stjohnvancouver.org Bible study resources that they're all free you're just you're very welcome to just download them uh, so um, and they're all they're all done really in this format uh, where it takes you through working through the so make use of them there's lots of lots of good resources out there yeah. okay well thanks so much for joining okay. us today it's yeah, been great to you be with the people in my small group and hopefully everybody else's small group. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. <laughs> Are you good. closing prayer? I will, yeah. yeah. Or do you want to, Bronwyn? Why don't you? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Lord, um, uh, how precious is this gathering and are these faces and the lives of all these women here? Um, each one uh, tells your story, is a living testimony of your grace. Mm -hmm. And um, we thank you for the great privilege of being fellow workers in the gospel. 
um, that you've called us into the into the harvest and we pray you continue to encourage us in the harvest work sometimes it can be discouraging particularly during this time of COVID when we're separated physically it can be discouraging we pray you'd strengthen and abundantly bless each of the ministries represented by each of the women here and help us to grow in the work of ministry, rightly handling your word of God to learn. Um, we pray that you'd help us to lead women into the, the uh, lead women into the food of the word of God, which will enrich them. Use our ministries to save women, to grow them, and make them disciples. We pray. We ask this for Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today.